Great. So um, happy to be with all of you today to talk about Faust and AI. Uh, as I said earlier, that's the URL for these slides, which will be especially helpful if you're attending the workshop in the afternoon because this slide, the slides have links to some more things, and so you can browse that during the lunch break, and it could be helpful for lunch. Um, so I'm happy to be back uh, in Lyon after 13 years. I came here on vacation uh, with my family, and it's a wonderful city, so glad to be back. Those are me and the Trabul <laughs> on the left. Um, my background is uh, primarily in real-time computer graphics, and more recently uh, I attended a master's program at Karma, and there, there I studied audio and machine learning. That's how I got introduced to Chuck and Faust, uh, which I became very excited about. Um, I managed to pivot that into a PhD topic, uh, which I'm now pursuing as a first-year computer science PhD student at Princeton. Um, but the, these real-time graphics um, I, I made with Touch Designer, uh, which I'm a big fan of, and uh, it, it kind of ties together a lot of the software that I use, such as Faust and Chuck. Um, but today's topic is mainly Faust and AI. Uh, and also the theme of the uh, workshop this year is, uh, is domain-specific languages, Faust being one of those uh, specific audio DSLs. There is a great history of domain-specific languages for computer music. Uh, in this paper from Roger Dannenberg, there's, we have a timeline. And on the right side, we see Faust. And we see some familiar friends in here. We see Chuck. And we see Max MSP, and we see Miller Puckett with uh, PD, and all the languages going back in time. Um, but what makes Faust special? Uh, or here are some more languages on the box on the right uh, that are uh, newer DSLs for music. But what makes Faust uh, special? Well, you can browse the syntax page and get a, a quick overview of Faust. Um, but primarily, it is a functional programming languages. And these kinds of languages have some uh, usual characteristics. One thing is that you can declare things out of order, which is useful. Uh, you, there are also no side effects. When you give the same arguments to a function, you get the same result. And there's also pattern matching. That's very common in functional programming languages. Uh, also, there is the block diagram algebra, which has five essential operators. Those are the parallel operator with the comma, the sequence operator, the split operator, the merge operator, and the recurse operator. And so this is essential to what makes Faust um, a special programming language is because you're thinking about composing these uh, block circuits or boxes uh, together uh, to make uh, in use useful uh, audio DSP. Uh, it also has a very interesting compiler with intermediate stages, and I'm going to be talking about those things more today. So those intermediate stages are boxes, signals, and the Faust imperative representation. And also at the end of the Faust imperative representation, Faust gets translated into target languages such as C++, WebAssembly, and so on. But I won't necessarily be talking about those. I'll be talking about the intermediate representations like boxes, signals, and FIR. Okay, so a motivating example for the talk today is optimization and machine learning. Uh, in this example, we have a low pass filter and there is a cutoff. And the cutoff is a value of 440. But what if we don't know that the best value is 440? What if we uh, just have some data set of inputs and outputs, and we, we suspect that the audio is going through a low-pass filter in order to produce the output audio, but how do we find out that the, uh, the magic value uh, of 440 is what transformed the input into the output? And this is where uh, machine learning and optimization can play a role. So I'll be talking about that today. Um, a more interesting and complex example is sound matching via uh, machine learning. So this is a, a recent synthesizer called SynPlant2, and you can provide a short sample of audio, like a one-shot of a synthesizer, and it can almost magically infer the settings of the synthesizer to recreate that sound. And so that is a kind of mach machine learning and optimization problem. Um, another motivating example is program synthesis. So here we have that same uh, low-pass filter, uh, there is a cutoff parameter, and I've just inserted some white space in between the, uh, the start of the program and the end of the program. But what if the cutoff could be something downstream of another uh, piece of code? So cutoff, we might decide, needs to be uh, something that goes into a remap, so that it's something that gets remapped into the output range 440 hertz and 880 hertz. But now we need to decide what goes into this remap, and we might decide that it's going to be an oscillator. But then the oscillator needs a frequency, and we decide, okay, we're going to give it frequency one, and we're going to give frequency one is something that gets mapped into four hertz and 16 hertz. And this process continues uh, recursively, and uh, here we decide it needs to be an oscillator again, but it could have been any other Faust function. 
and then we name a variable frequency, and the frequency now gets declared as a terminal node, which, was, which is the slider. So this process of procedurally making programs is a kind of search problem where we might be, uh, have a specification we want to make an interesting audio effect or to match a certain database of sound, but we have this uh, search procedure via program synthesis to create new Faust programs and, and see what uh, can be created. Uh, another example uh, on program synthesis is just to be able to kind of re recreate an existing plugin. So here, this is a, a, a VST plugin from Steve Duda, who's the author of Serum, and on Reddit, he uh, gave this description of what is going on inside the DSV. So you might want to use something like Faust GPT or program synthesis in order to uh, parse this text and then come up with a almost reverse engineering of what is going on in that VST. And that leads me to another topic, which would be reverse engineering of black box uh, models. So in this case, we might have a guitar pedal, but the reason we call it black box is because we may not have a diagram of what is going inside the, uh, the pedal, and that's why uh, we call it black box. Um, alternatively to black box optimization, there's white box optimization. So you might have a box and you would have a diagram of what's going inside, but you don't necessarily uh, know the numbers uh, that are kind of the hard-coded constants that go into that system. And so you would use machine learning to figure out what those numbers are. But in the case of pedals, uh, it's just black box. Um, and the reason you might want to use program synthesis is that you could propose many models uh, many topologies of DSP circuits, and now you use program synthesis to search over many models, and you num numerically optimize each candidate model. You may end up finding a more efficient or interpretable uh, implementation than the black box, so it, it can lead to happy accidents. <clears throat> so uh, now we're going to be uh, transitioning into some of the machine learning aspects uh, more, and uh, one background project on this is the intro to DDSP with PyTorch. This was recently presented at Izmir uh, in Italy uh, in November. You can visit this URL, which is a, a very great introduction to the topic of differential digital signal processing, DDSP. Uh, it was authored uh, by these uh, students from QMO, Queen Mary University of London. And uh, they also wrote a survey paper, which is a review of differential digital signal processing for music and speech synthesis. And in it, they write, rewriting DSP algorithms in an automatic differentiation library can itself be time consuming and introduces an additional burden to the research pipeline. However, recent efforts have sought to support the translation of DSP code into differential implementations. So what they're acknowledging is that this, this process of uh, rewriting, of, of having an, uh, an audio signal processing engineer write that code a second time in a uh, machine learning framework is time consuming and prone to errors, and uh, they're looking for an automated solution, but they, uh, their second sentence there gave a shout out to uh, some of the work that I've been doing uh, in, in Faust and Jax, which is automatic translation from an audio DSL, such as Faust, into a machine learning framework, which is DDSP. So the takeaway point is that people are still manually writing differentiable DSP code in PyTorch, which is time consuming and error prone, and they're not taking advantage of the Faust libraries, which already have great DSP code. So I'm happy to share with all of you that there is an automated solution to making this DSP differentiable and scalable, and that solution is Faust to Jax, taking the audio DSL of Faust and automatically converting it into the Jax machine learning framework for numerical optimization. So uh, to recap, the motiva motiva motivating examples were numerical optimization, program synthesis, and reverse engineering, and a pipeline that I am imagining and going to develop more in my research is, is this one here. So we can start with existing DSP code, or we can use program synthesis to create that DSP code, and we do that in Faust. We can do it at any of the representation levels, which are either Faust code, or signals, or boxes. Uh, signals are actually lower level than boxes. Um, and now we convert that to JAX, and then we optimize in JAX. And uh, we complete the loop by learning from what we've optimized to inform how we do our uh, program search in a better way. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay, great. So um, the over, now uh, another overview of the uh, topic today is that I'm going to talk about numerical optimization with Faust and JAX, and I'm going to talk about F effects with learnable parameters and effects with learnable parameter automation and then I'll talk about a subtractive synthesizer and a wavetable synthesizer. 
and then a newer and slightly improved implementation of the Yamaha DX7 synthesizer, and all of this runs within JAX. It is differentiable. It can be numerically optimized. And then in the latter portion of the talk, I'll talk about uh, program synthesis and how we can generate Faust code, generate boxes, and generate signals. And that can be useful for exploring the space of potential topologies of DSP code. Okay, first topic is numerical optimization in Faust and JAX. So here is a related work on uh, 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 VST plugins and using machine learning to optimize the parameters that you pick. So this is work from Adobe in 2021. It is called Differentiable Di uh, Signal Processing with Black Box Audio Effects. So here, it, with my mouse, I'm pointing out the, uh, the audio effect here, which is a Linux LV2 plugin, which is just C++ code that's compiled and it's running on your computer, and you can't optimize it, or you can't uh, uh, calculate gradients of it in a machine learning sense because it's a, a, a black box model. But they use gradient estimation uh, with an interesting technique called SPSA. And with that, they're able to train the deep encoder to predict the parameters that should be used in order to achieve a certain effect. So if their goal is to make it sound like a, a professional recording audio podcast, they have a deep encoder that can listen to the, audio, the input audio and decide the parameters to pick for their uh, compressor and gator and various other effects in order to make the audio sound clean and professional. Uh, in practice, uh, the way this works is that they have a sliding window of, say, one second, and uh, for that sliding window of one second, they are predicting the parameters that are used in a smaller frame within that one second. So when you take that one second window and you slide it across your entire 60 second, 120 second recording or anything, you are predicting uh, parameters and you can smooth out those parameters over time, and so you end up with an automation curve. So you, you get an, a time series prediction of all of the parameters in your model. <clears throat> now this is uh, interesting, but it's not using Faust. Uh, they're limited by what pl uh, plugins they have available in LV2, and also they're using gradient estimation, so they don't have access to uh, a kind of ground truth analytic gradient, and that is what is appealing about uh, the, the JAX implementation, which I'll show with you now. So here we're going to do a very simple example, which I hope that you can learn from and expand into more complex examples. We are going to be optimizing a filter's cutoff frequency. So here we have a low pass, and the value is 440. So it's a magic value of 440, but we're going to pretend that uh, we, we don't know that in advance. And also, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a black box example. Sorry, this is a white box example, because we, we know what the hidden model's DSP code is, and we're just trying to figure out what that magic number is. So our training set is pairs of inputs and outputs. The inputs are going to be white noise, uh, just full spectrum white noise, and uh, it's going to go to this system, which is a low pass filter, and so then the, the paired output example is going to be that same noise with a low pass. And our goal is to use uh, gradient estimation to take these pairs of inputs and outputs in order to figure out what the optimal cutoff parameter is. So uh, in this graph on the right, we, we start with a cutoff value of 10,000. So here on the x-axis, we have 10,000, and when we go up on the y-axis, uh, we start with a loss of about 0.3. And when you follow the gradient, you're gonna go to the left and you go down the slope and you end up with a value of 440, which is the uh, local uh, minimum and also the global minimum. That's not necessarily the case in all machine learning uh, problems. Uh, there can be lots of local minima, which makes this loss landscape uh, more challenging, uh, but there are uh, machine learning tricks in order to uh, improve that. So when we plot this another way, uh, on the x-axis we have time and we see that the loss falls very steadily over time and stabilizes with the loss of 10 to the negative four, which is close to zero. <clears throat> uh, so that, this example was just one parameter that we were optimizing. And of course, DSP is more complicated than that. You might have 10 parameters that you need to optimize or 150 or even 1,000. In this example, uh, which I've linked to, uh, this is another notebook uh, called the QDAX notebook in my Python library called DawDreamer. And this example is a parametric equalizer. There are three sections, uh, with each section having a bandwidth in hertz, a frequency in hertz, and a gain in decibels, and then a, a, fine, a final main volume parameter in decibels. And so from, we, we may not know anything about the parameters in advance, but it can optimize and find the perfect or near perfect um, solution and recover those 10 parameters in, in just a minute. So you can check out that, that notebook and I may have time to show it in the afternoon. Uh, so a more complex example is to do 
uh, inference of the parameters automation. So we are no longer assuming that the parameters held constant over the entire recording. This cutoff parameter is like a knob on some module and we are saying that whoever created the audio could have been changing that knob over time and we're trying to figure out what the animation was of that, uh, of that parameter. So here in this DSP, I just have a box on the right to indicate that this is a system that takes one input and it has one output. The input here is the signal that is to be filtered and then the output is the signal that comes out, which is the filtered signal. So I'm just going to refactor this code on the left and put it down here. So on line three, I just retitle it to be FX and now I just say that process is uh, the wire symbol uh, sequenced into FX. So it has one input and it has one output. This is the same code and to emphasize it's just a signal to uh, be filtered and the output is the filtered signal. So uh, what we want is actually for the cutoff to not be inside the box, we want the, the uh, inside, inside the block diagram, we want the cutoff signal to be lifted out. And the way we do that is with a new feature in Faust which is widget modulation. It was introduced in Faust uh, to 6.9.0. So here I declare on line four, replace equals cut in parallel with a wire. And when I use this new widget syntax, I, I say cut off and replace. And the cut is taking the H slider that exists inside the box and cutting it. And then the wire is introducing a new audio rate input to the system. So we end up with a box with two inputs. The first, uh, the, the thing that I replaced, I, I inserted a wire here and so this wire shows up as a new cutoff signal which is an audio rate signal to the system. Uh, an important point here is that the cutoff signal is no longer clipped or uh, clamped between the range of 20 and 20,000 as it was defined by this H slider here. It's now totally unconstrained. So if we're doing machine learning here, we have to make sure that whatever is providing input to our new box with two inputs isn't providing a uh, out of range value of the cutoff frequency because if you were to prov provide a cutoff signal, a cutoff frequency of zero or above the Nyquist frequency, then you, you can have an unstable filter where you divide by zero or explode to infinity. So uh, this is that same code on the previous slide. Uh, and the, note, the example that I'm going to show uh, the code of in the afternoon is this uh, example here. So we have the cutoff and the hidden value of that cutoff at automation over time is, uh, is a sine wave. So we're, we're saying that the person changed the knob or set an, you know, an automation curve to change that knob uh, in, a, in a sine wave pattern going from like 500 hertz to 18,500 hertz. And uh, our machine learning system is able to take just an input audio and just a ground truth audio and only listening to those two things, it is able to recover the automation uh, of the system. So to emphasize, uh, the, the orange line is not looking at the blue line in order to match it. It, it, it is, has no awareness at all of the blue line. It is simply listening to uh, the generated audio from the system and the ground truth audio and through uh, gradient descent, it is able to uh, recover and, and perfectly match the, the blue line. You may notice that uh, the orange line is a little bit pointy and that's because it's uh, the number of parameters that the trainable model has is actually limited. We have one second of audio which would be 44,100 samples uh, but that's a lot of parameters to optimize. So we can actually say I only want to optimize 40 values and we can stretch those 40 values with linear interpolation over the one second and then, uh, and then try to inf uh, match the ground truth signal. So that's why it's a little bit pointy. But if we were to give the model, the trained model, more learning capacity, then it would actually look like this. So this orange line is matching that blue line much more perfectly and the, the notebook in the afternoon is going to demonstrate that more. Uh, this is the code, so uh, you can, you can uh, uh, check that out later, but I'll cover it a bit in the afternoon. So are there any questions about this so far? Okay, so another example is a subtractive synthesizer. So here we have the basic setup for a, a polyphonic synthesizer in Faust. We have to declare a frequency, a gain, and a gate. Frequency being in hertz, uh, a gain being like a velocity value between zero and one, and a gate being like a threshold of velocity. It's either zero or one. Uh, we have a sawtooth with uh, the frequency and then it gets modulated with a volume. It goes to our filter and then we split it out into stereo. The filter cutoff has a constant value of 5,000, but that is 
pretty boring for a subtractive synthesizer where you want to introduce a modulation where another envelope can modulate that value of 5,000. And what if that envelope had parameters for its ADSR and those parameters were learnable? So you would want to use gradient estimation, gradient uh, descent in order to figure out what those parameters were of the envelope that is modulating the filter cutoff. So when we code that kind of example, it would look like this. We have an envelope in the middle section and we have a range. So the range is uh, 440 hertz to 15,000 hertz. And so we might be estimating the parameters of our uh, envelope that are routed into our, our free, uh, filter cutoff. The next example in the notebook for the afternoon is a wave table synthesizer that is inspired by uh, the Serum VST as well as other uh, wave table synthesizers. Uh, in this example, there is a wave table here, which is a kind of 2D representation of wave tables. There is a knob here. So this knob is titled WT pause for wave table position. And when we change this knob, we are linearly interpolating among uh, many wave tables. So when, when the knob is at zero, we are using the wave table that lo that's located here. But when wave table is one, then we're using the wave table all the way in the back. This is a very effective model, uh, popular in EDM and other genres. So you can get really interesting growls and, and and wub wub effects and stuff. So it's really great um, uh, signal processing technique and we're going to implement it in JAX. There is already a related work on this topic. There's a paper titled Differentiable Wavetable Synthesis from uh, TikTok uh, researchers in 2022. And in it, they are able to uh, recover or uh, take, take a data set of uh, existing audio and figure out what wavetables should be used in uh, in order to recreate those sounds. Um, but one limitation of their work is that uh, they uh, don't share their code. So that is uh, kind of a, a, a weak point. Uh, sorry to be critical of them though, but you should or open source your code in my opinion. Uh, but another issue is that they're not using a lot of the other great DSP that exists. So Faust has the Faust libraries and their wavetable synthesizer isn't necessarily taking advantage of all of the other great DSP that exists in Faust where you can have distortion effects and echo and so on. And all of those would be differentiable as I'm pointing out today. So uh, in this example, we have a wavetable synthesizer. And what I'll show in more detail in the afternoon is that we will create wave cycles. So we will use NumPy to save out uh, these uh, time series where each time series is 2048 samples to represent a wave cycle. Um, the, the first one is a sine cycle in blue and then we have triangle in orange, a square wave, a pulse width modulation wave and then a sawtooth wave. And so uh, when we use uh, Faust and Jax in order to render this audio in parallel on a GPU, TPU, CPU, etc., we are able to generate all of these examples of audio so one example could be uh, outputting uh, audio that sounds like a, a sine wave, a triangle, a square, p plus width modulation, and so on and so on. And what is interesting is that the wave table is learnable. So if I were to provide uh, a, a set of sounds through gradient descent, we could actually optimize those uh, wave tables, those 2048 uh, values in order to recreate that sound. So it's very much like uh, the earlier TikTok paper. But another cool thing is that the interpolation between the wavetables is also learnable. So here um, we have this knob, which is like the WT pause slider. And it's, it, it, it's a value that goes between 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if, it, it, if it's exactly 0, you get a sine wave. If it's exactly 1, you get a triangle wave. But if it's somewhere in between sine and triangle, then you actually get this linear interpolation between uh, the sine and triangle. So you can see. Um, at, the, at the top, uh, this is sine and this is triangle, but when that parameter is slightly in between, then you get this interpolation between uh, sine and triangle. And when you have some envelope that's modulating that wavetable position, then you can get very interesting sounds. And so all of these sounds are, are generated and rendered in parallel, so when you have a GPU uh, using JAX and executing this code, you can have 500 plus synthesizers running at once. And as GPU uh, memory, limitations go up as a consumer card goes from eight gigabytes to 16, 24, and so on over time, uh, I think uh, rendering audio with jacks in the, in the GPU realm is going to be increasingly important. Uh, so also on this topic, there is a, a new implementation of the DX7 that I've been uh, working on. It is a, uh, 
we've long known that Faust has a great uh, implementation of the Yamaha DX7, but I noticed uh, some limitations that were documented inside of it. It was missing an LFO. It was missing some things relevant to the breakpoint uh, parameters. So I read uh, the, the owner's manual of the DX7 and made an effort to improve it in various ways. Uh, and that code is now shared at this uh, GitHub repository. Uh, but I welcome other people to read the code and, and uh, improve it further. Um, I made a Python script that can parse SYX preset files and turn them into an aggregate CSV. So you can, you can download uh, for free off the internet uh, like, uh, like easily 20,000 DX7 presets. And now you can use JAX to efficiently render all of them uh, as like one shots um, or with cords uh, uh, with the GPU. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And also just acknowledging that, that the DX7 implementation is still not perfect. You are definitely encouraged to go to this repository and plug in your own synthesizer to come up with your own uh, model to plug in your own effects and so on and create your own data set of music or to just use this as a seed project in your own research. And I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that one-on-one um, -on -one if you can find me afterward. Okay, so uh, a general research recipe is to think about the Faust DSP you want to use, pick a data set or make your own, uh, pick an architecture and a learning algorithm such as stochastic gradient descent or reinforcement learning and quality diversity. That's a, a reference to the notebook in the afternoon. Um, you also want to pick a loss function and an optimizer and evaluation metrics. And there are other good ideas in Andre Kaprathi's recipe for training neural networks. Any questions on this? <laughs> okay, so latter topic is program synthesis. Uh, the question is, can we parse, mutate, and generate at Faust's various representation levels? Those representation levels are Faust code, which we're familiar with and write uh, pretty often, I hope. Uh, and Boxes, which is a, a new API that was opened up about two years ago, I think, to the public uh, in C++. Um, and there's also a signal representation. After that, there's Faust imperative representation. But my personal opinion is that this is possibly too low level for machine learning. Learning, You wouldn't want to manipulate it at this level because it's just too, level, uh, too uh, low level and not abstract enough to come up with useful um, kind of mutations. Um, and similarly, the back end level I don't think is relevant uh, for our interests um, because it's a totally different language representation. So we're, we're kind of audio DSL engineers and once you turn it into C++ or uh, Rust or any other programming language, it's no longer an audio DSL. So it's um, a, a little less appealing. Okay, so uh, the first topic is generating Faust code. This is uh, a slightly complex example. Uh, and I'm, I'm not giving away, unfortunately, all of the code yet to this, but I just want to talk people through it. So here we're using the component uh, uh, op, uh, syntax in, in Faust in order to load from a local file. And now once we've loaded our local file envelope, it's going to take, this is a, a, a DSP function that takes some number of operators. And you, as the programmer, coded this envelope.dsp file, so you know the number of <coughs> operators that it takes. Um, so you load all of your pre, uh, preset operators and things. You also load all of your components. And now what you need to do is, if, if your topic is modular synthesis, which is one of my main interests, then what you want to do is compose all of these components together. So you know exactly how many arguments each function takes, and it's just up to you to come up with a generative system that composes all of these functions together in a reliable and predictable way, but with some uh, generative capacity. So the formula here is that um, you would want to make a basic DSL abstraction of Faust code. So Faust code is already a DSL, but what if you make a DSL layer on top of Faust? And now you make a compiler for that new DSL that you've created and you go to Faust. So to, to recap, you start with some set of Faust components, then you build some examples with your components just for practice. Now you create a DSL for your task. That DSL can be a form of YAML, JSON, Python dictionary, or anything else you come up with. And ChatGPT is especially helpful for teaching people like myself about uh, uh, making DSLs. So you can use things like Antler and Lex and Yak and stuff, and you can get creative in terms of making your own DSL on top of the Faust programming language. And uh, uh, things like uh, J uh, JSON and, and Python and, and dictionaries and things like Faust GPT is really excellent at that. So it'll have some interesting suggestions for you. Then you create a compiler from the DSL to Faust, and then you create a generative mutation procedure for the DSL. And once you do that, you're able to have generative Faust code. 
Uh, so related to this, the next step is generating boxes. Boxes are this intermediate representation of Faust, and I've created Python bindings to boxes. So I have a GitHub repository called DawDreamer, which you can install with pip install DawDreamer, and there are links to this in, in the slides. And there is this page that gives an outline of the different box uh, functions. So uh, once, you, once you import DawDreamer, then there are these things uh, there that are equivalent to what you see in the box API in the C++ version of Faust, but these are just Python bindings to those functions. So you can compose boxes via Python. So you're, you're interacting with this raw and powerful uh, intermediate representation of Faust, but you're doing it via Python. So when we do that in Python, we, uh, we can write Faust code uh, as just plain text, and now we can convert from a box, uh, from, we can take our DSP code and turn it into our box. So this box has one input, which is the wire, and the output is just one because it's the result of an addition. So we can assert that our box that we've created has one input and one output, and uh, we can do this in, a, in an equivalent way. So here, instead of uh, going from box from DSP, we can just use these operators. So we create a box wire, and we have 3.14, and we add it to our wire. So the result is a box that also has one input and one output, just like the code at the top. Um, and now, it's possible to convert our box, which we've scripted via Python, and we can turn that into JAX code. Once it's in JAX code, then you can numerically optimize it, in, it just like those examples that I was showing you earlier about cutoff. Uh, cut off. So uh, it's, it would be interesting to have more people get practice with the box API and have generative procedures for uh, composing boxes together and see what kinds of crazy stuff you can come up with. Um, so as I said earlier, once we have our JAX code, with it, which is Python code, we can actually execute that in the global scope in Python, which is a little bit of a security risk, but um, you just have to trust me or whoever else that the, the JAX code that you've generated is safe, and you can extract the class from the global uh, namespace, and then you can use that just as if you had written class my DSP colon and so on and defined it like a regular class. So in, uh, this is uh, the technique of generating boxes. Um, so <clears throat> so uh, earlier I showed you one way, which is to call box add, and box add takes two arguments, but here, we are actually overriding what's known as a dunder method in Python. So in dunder, it's like a, 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 an object can have a, a function like th that's two underscores, add, and then two underscores again. So when you override that argument, as I've done in my C++ bindings, um, we are able to make it so that you can just call plus on these um, objects. So this is a, another way of creating this box that has one input and one output. Another interesting thing you can do is an in-place operation. So we can say plus equals box real, and we can also implicitly cast five into box real. So box plus equals five works, and that five is automatically cast into box real, which is a floating point number, real just being uh, the same meaning as floating point. Um, so another cool thing about boxes is that you can use the techniques that I mentioned earlier about components. So suppose we have uh, cool component.dsp, and in it we have this constant, uh, which is size. When we call uh, box from DSP, we can make a reference to a local uh, DSP file on, on, on disk called coolcomponent.dsp, and then we can override the parameter size equals three. And when we specify a path to our directory which holds this cool component file, now our box here is actually going to have three inputs and three outputs because size is actually three, and we, we created something with si.bus3, which is three inputs and three outputs. So very powerful uh, API uh, with boxes. And I'm emphasizing here that size one has been replaced with three here. So component is a very useful technique in Faust. Um, so generating boxes, uh, we, can, we can have two strategies um, for program synthesis with boxes. One is top down from a root node. So here on the right, um, this is like Haskell or some other functional programming language, so we might start with reduce uh, as our top level root node, but then reduce needs to take three arguments, and uh, so you just kind of recursively determine what those arguments need to be, and sometimes when you create a new argument, that is a function, and then you have to figure out what those arguments are. So when you follow that uh, top-down procedure, then you end up with a full expression up here. 
So the equivalent thing in, in Faust with boxes is to say, give, I want to have a box with two inputs and two outputs that does blah. And uh, now you think to yourself, I know that box par, the, the parallel operator, uh, can result in such a box. But if I call box parallel, I'm going to need two arguments. Well, uh, that, those would be box one and box two. Uh, and that can result in such a, a box with two inputs and two outputs. But now you have to re recurse and say, uh, give me box one and box two. And so at the end of this procedure, you would end up with uh, a box with two inputs and two outputs. Once you uh, end up at a terminal node, just like down here, um, uh, X and five are terminal nodes, and here X and Y are terminal nodes. A different procedure would be bottom-up synthesis from leaf nodes. So you, it's just the opposite. You start with the, the leaf nodes down here, and you iteratively create new boxes until you end up, kind of luckily, uh, so to speak, with a box that has two inputs and two outputs. Um, and just a digression, this is kind of like L systems and, and generative grammars. Uh, so you can, uh, you can go into that rabbit hole and learn more about it. Um, so uh, I have some early experiments in this topic of top-down synthesis. Uh, where I create a box here, which has two inputs and two outputs, and I just give it an identifier 12. I randomly like flip a coin, and I decide that the box operator that I want to use is box sequence, and now I, now I know that uh, I need two arguments for box sequence. And I decide that um, if I have a box with two inputs and one output, and a box with one input and two outputs, then when I sequence those two things together, I end up with a box with two inputs and two outputs. And that meets my specification here of two inputs and two outputs. So box one, two, and 11, which was uh, generatively created, needs to be uh, decided. And so I place that here, and I flip a coin again, and I see that box sequence, uh, it needs to take uh, this argument, box one, two, and 10. And I follow this procedure iteratively again, box one, two, 10, I flip a coin, I decide that that's going to be the result of calling box split. And when you do this procedure enough times, you can end up with a full abstract syntax tree of uh, boxes, and it could look like this. And what's interesting here is that box 211 is actually used in multiple places, as I've highlighted here. So it's a, it was a dynamically generated box that is used in multiple places in the abstract syntax tree. And this code that I showed you on the previous page can actually be visualized as a DAG. Uh, and here we have a root node, so that root node is a sequence operator, and it is a box with two inputs and two outputs, and it has that unique identifier 12, and you can see that it has two arguments, which are, which are specified here, and also this box, 211, you can see that it, it flows into two other uh, dynamically generated boxes. There's related work on this subject which was presented at ICASP uh, this summer. It's called Blind Estimation of Audio Processor Graph. It's a really impressive paper, and I think it's one of the first of its kind. They're able to take audio and to use a transformer model to predict and generate the, uh, an estimation of the audio processor graph that was used to create that audio. They're only predicting effects. They're not predicting instruments, but it's a, an impressive work nonetheless. And once they've generated that graph with the transformer model, they use a separate model in order to predict the parameters that would be most useful for that audio processor graph. But one limitation of this work is that they don't use differentiable DSP in order to improve those uh, audio processors. And also, their set of audio processors is somewhat limited compared to what is available within Faust. So what I would propose for future research is to get Faust involved in this, in this line of research where we are both relying on the Faust libraries to use our processors or instruments, and then also using differentiable DSP code to improve the predicted parameters. Um, and now the last uh, Faust representation level is signals, and there's just another uh, API, which I can uh, talk about more in the afternoon, um, but it's just, you can have sig sine uh, uh, for the sine, uh, like cosine operator, and a pi over two, so that would result in one. We add it to 1.5, and now we have an infinite stream of 1.5, and that's the signal API. So there's other work on Faust and AI, which is the Google Summer of Code uh, 2023 project where Thomas Rushton contributed code on automatic differentiation within the Faust compiler. For GSOC 2024, you can propose your own idea by visiting this URL. And there's also the Julia tutorial by Cora Johnson Robertson. So check out that as well. Final reminders, you can watch my talk on Faust Day 2023 on Romain Michon's YouTube, where I cover uh, some things that weren't covered in this presentation. There's actually zero overlap between what I've presented today and that, so do check that out if you're more interested. Uh, also, you can get a head start on the notebooks that I'll talk about in the afternoon. 
uh, using uh, Jack's notebooks uh, on the Daw Dreamer repository. Please tell me what you're up to with Faust and Jax. I would love to uh, help others in, in using this uh, research. And you can contact me at db1224 at princeton.edu. Thanks.